All right. O2. There we go. Back to this. Um, so the problem that, that Flex aimed to solve was we had, uh, how many people have used Silex micro framework? Yeah, like half people. It's nice, right? Because it's just one file. And then you have the Symfony Standard Edition, and so you had to decide which to use, um, which, which wasn't ideal. Um, so Flex is aimed at trying to solve it. In fact, Symfony 4, when you use Symfony 4, Flex will be the standard way to use and install Symfony. So the idea is that we start with just a compose.json file with as m small dependencies as possible, just the framework bundle from Symfony. It means there's no forms, there's no translations, there's no logger. It's just the framework bundle. And as we install things, the Flex plugin is going to read recipes, and I'll talk about where those are, and actually start creating our scaffolding for our project for us. Because if you've used a micro framework like Silex before, you know that it's great at first on day one, but then when you want to add twig templating or security, then you need to start adding directories and thinking about your directory structure. So Flex is going to do that for us. So I won't say any more than that because you guys will see that, but this is what we are going to look for. Good, good, good. If you guys look at your terminal, hopefully you still have your composer install terminal output. It looks mostly normal, except at the bottom there's something about three recipes, I think, like installing three recipes. So that is flex happening right there. So when we installed this, let's see, the three recipes are, yeah, Symfony Flex, Symfony Routing, and Symfony Framework Bundle. So whenever a package is installed, flex looks at a central repository to see if there's a recipe for that. And if there is, it processes that recipe. So everything that we have in our project, other than the composer.json file and the composer.lock file, is coming from one of those recipes. So what do we have now? We have like a config directory. It's not much. A config directory, source directory, web directory. Oh, pu sorry, public, public directory. There are a few things that were renamed. Public directory. And there's also a var directory. If you guys were to commit all the files, it's 14 files. And actually, if you don't count two git ignore files that are there just to keep directories, uh, empty directories there, there's only 12 files. So the smallest project is just 12 files, just the absolute minimum you need for a routing controller setup. A um, couple other things that, oh, a couple other things I want you guys to notice that the recipe did for us is it created a dot git ignore file with uh, defaults. And as you install more recipes, that's one of the things that they can do. You can install a recipe, and that recipe knows, well, I create this type of file, so I'm going to add something else to the gitignore. You guys can still modify the gitignore, but Flex is also going to modify your gitignore. It also modified your composer.json file. If you do a git status, you'll see that file is actually modified, and they added a couple of keys inside of there. So there's a number of things that a Flex recipe can do. Um, add files, obviously, but also edit gitignore, edit the composer.json other things like that. All right, so at this point, it is a, there's not much here, but this is actually already a fully functional, simply full stack project. To get the web server going, I want you guys to try this. This is going to be uh, interesting or controversial, or you will love it or you will hate it. We're going to run a make command. So to not cause confusion, there is a, um, a virtual host created for this project. We're not going to use the virtual host. We're going to use the built-in PHP web server. So if you run make serve, it should start a local host colon 8000 web server. And you should be able to pull up that URL and find a very fancy looking error page. Nice red on top and nice stack trace. Yes, I'm seeing lots of, lots of good errors. Not, we don't want ugly errors. We want good errors. Right, it makes sense. Resource not found, because there's, there's literally nothing, there's no routes inside of our project right now. Let me make sure that we all have everybody on that step. Good, good, good. Awesome. Remember, if you have any problems, look confused. All right, excellent. So the make file is another thing. So there's, there's kind of two changes happening in tandem at the same time. Uh, with Symfony 4. There's Symfony Flex, which is the recipe thing, 
And there's also just changes that we've made to the directory structure. So obviously, uh, renaming the directory from web to public has nothing to do with Flex. We just decided now would be a good time to create a more standard public directory. Um, one of the other changes is, at least now, I don't love it, but, but it, it's, it's what's in there now, is the make file. So you guys have a make file at the root of your project. And as you install recipes, it actually adds things to that make file. So that's why we're able to run make serve. And if you look in that file, make serve is basically a small wrapper around running the standard Basically, it's a wrapper around that command. In pointing at the, web, at the public directory as our document root, but it's just a wrapper around that. Yeah, question is, is there a potential to, rem will the make file maybe be removed? Maybe it's the most controversial part of this. I don't like it, but I haven't talked to Fabian about it. The problem is that you guys, as Symfony users, you know that there is, there is a bin console then you can run all kinds of cool commands in that. And we are going to install that in a second, but it's not a requirement anymore. So I think what Fabian wanted was if somebody doesn't have bin console, there might still be a few things that they need to run. Um, there needs to be some sort of an intelligent scripting language in there to run commands. So he used the very standard make file. Has no dependencies. People don't need to install things. Like if you have a Unix system, you have make, so everyone has it. The downside, if you open it, it's really ugly. It's like, ooh. So in theory, you never need to write any of these. You can, of course, write these. But in theory, they would just be handled by the recipes. Um, so it's possible it might change. I think the tricky thing is, to what? What would it change to? Yeah, Ben Console requires you to have the console installed. Yeah, so what? I mean, it's almost the first thing we're going to, going to install is Ben Console. Um, all right, perfect. So let's keep rocking. All right, so we have the most basic Symphony project installed right now. So now we're going to start opting into our dependencies because we don't have everything anymore. We need to actually say, I want this, I want this, I want this. So one of the things that Symphony provides is a, as I say, a better dev server. Like we're right, right now, via make serve, it's just php s. Symphony actually has a web server bundle, which still behind the scenes uses the php s command, but it adds a little bit more uh, nice features around that. So okay, so we want to have a slightly better dev server. So we're going to install the uh, Symphony's web server bundle. So go ahead and run that command. And notice what you might expect and we are going to see this multiple times. You would expect the command to look something like this. I told you there's a web server bundle. It's a package on Packagist. So you could run compose requires symphony slash web dash server dash bundle. That would work. One of the things that Flex has are aliases. So there's a bunch of built in aliases. And so in this case, you can actually say compose requires server and then Flex translates that to the longer version. The reason that's done is that the core, in the core of Symfony, we're trying to be a little bit more opinionated on what we think is the, the recommended way to do this or the recommended way to do that. For example, later we're going to install a logger. And to install the logger, you're going to install the monolog bundle. But you can just say composer require logger. And that's going to give you the logger that is sort of recommended by Symphony. Yep. Uh, can we add custom aliases to Flex? You can't, no. Yeah, question is, can we add custom aliases to Flex? And you can't add custom aliases to Flex. And that's sort of on purpose. They're in a protected repository. So um, actually, let me show you guys a few things here. Right now, it's not the best user, in, uh, it's not the prettiest web page, because uh, things are alpha, obviously. But if you go to symphony.sh in your browser, this is actually going to show you all of the official Flex recipes, Flex packages, 
and the alias is next to them. So you'll see web server bundle there and you'll see that it's also called server and I think has a few other aliases on there. So this is what we're going to be working from. Yeah, Marco. Where are the aliases Good. Where are the aliases defined? Glad you asked that. In fact, where are the recipes defined? The recipes, like the fact that when we installed the framework bundle and it, 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 it had a recipe and created in a config directory and a public directory, that actually doesn't live in the framework bundle repository. There's a separate repository for the recipes. And you can find it. Actually, I want you guys to go to it. at github.com slash symphony slash recipes. So check out that repository. This is going to be a good repository to have open because as we do things, you can go look and see what the recipe looks like and then see what happened in your project. So there, um, this repository is protected. And, and what I mean is, we, of course, uh, anyone can submit a pull request to add a recipe, but there's lots of rules around what gets accepted and what doesn't get accepted. Because this is meant to be a curated list, not just like I have an OK bundle and I created an OK recipe and I threw it into Symphony Recipes and now everyone can install my kind of crappy bundle. So it's like, no, 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 we say you have to have like a README and there's a big long list of things that you have to do to get inside of here. Yep. Yeah, wait, so can you asking? Why is it part of the like, compose JSON file? Is that what it's Yeah, why is this a separate repository? Yeah, yeah, so the question is, and this is a very common question, why, why are the recipes in a separate repository versus maybe inside the package itself, right? And there's two reasons for that. One is, honestly, simplicity, so that um, Flex itself doesn't need to scan many, many, many repositories to get the full list of all of the available recipes. But the second thing is, well, actually, I'm going to say three reasons. The second one is so that we can have this curated list so that not everyone can create uh, recipes that show up in the list. And the third one, and actually most important, is that you can have recipes for things that aren't bundles. So there's actually a recipe for PHP units. So obviously, we're not going to expect PHP unit to put a Symfony Flex recipe into their repository. Um, but there is a PHP units recipe because we can maintain it here. So it allows us to add recipes for anything. Um, now, one of the other questions when we start talking about this very curated, opinionated list, like only these recipes get in, your recipe can't get in because we think it's not a good enough recipe. We have a second repository. If I remember correctly. A contrib repository. And this one is less guarded. And we may or may not do it later. But recipes from this repository aren't installed by default. You actually need to set a little flag in your composer.json file that says, I want to install recipes from this uh, contrib repository. So right now, if you tried to do a composer require on one of the packages inside the contrib repository, it would install, but you wouldn't get its recipe unless you went to your composer.json file and opted into it. And you'll see that if you look at your composer.json file, there's a key near the bottom. I can't remember. It's like allow contrib or something like that. And it's set to zero now or it's set to false. And you can change that to true. And then you can install things from the contrib repository. Again, these are things that might change because it makes it a little bit less obvious that, that you need to do, do this in order to install one of these. But we're trying to find a way where we can have a protected, uh, a recommended high quality recipes for people. Um, that you know are going to be good, but also not shut the door because we want other people to be able to add recipes. Yep. So the fact that you have an alias, does that mean that you are hijacking the Pokemon? We are very good. Yeah, yeah, I actually just looked at the implementation yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, update require and yeah, I think it's install. Yeah, yeah, hijack some. Yep. I don't, yeah, so the question is, are we ever going to be able to install recipes from the repository themselves? I know, it does a little bit, yeah, so the question is, this complicates maintenance, and I think that's one of the things that it's 
possible we might be able to, be able to install recipes from the repository? Yeah, it's, it's a thought I've had too, because we do have things in two places now. So if you make a, a change to your bundle over here, then you need to go make a change to, maybe you now need to go change the recipe. You know, it's always nice when things are in one place. Yep. I think what might, I mean, there might, we might find a healthy medium where the recipe is in core, but one of the things you might be able to do in the recipe is say, so one of, one of the operations you can do in a recipe, one of the most common operations you can do in a recipe, so if you look at the recipes inside of here, is you'll see a little operation that says copy. And it says copy this file or this directory into their project. But that file and directory live in the recipe. So I could see someday in the future where it's possible that you have a different copy operation where you can say copy from the package. So that way you could just make a change to your config.yml or whatever file you're shipping with your bundle. And then, and then as soon as that updates, then people get that. Uh, run scripts like uh, Composer? I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't remember. It says on, I think on the main recipes page, it gives you a big description below there of what you can and can't do. I can't remember if that is one that you can do or not. I know you can modify composer.json to add scripts, but that's not exactly what you're asking. Um, and yes, there's also people have asked about what about like private repositories, private recipes. These are all things that Fabian has said, yeah, it makes sense. We should do it. It's just a matter of, of when and, and finding the time to do it. Because um, it's kind of a cool idea, especially if you have lots of projects, if you're constantly starting projects, to be able to have your own company recipe. It's a pretty cool idea. And an internal flex server. Yeah, internal flex server, yeah. Yep. Ah, good question. Could this be used for Laravel or other projects? It's just for Symfony because everything is uh, centered around the framework. Yeah, so if, yes, but I think it won't be possible to use this outside of Symfony framework until maybe like private repositories, private recipes are allowed or something. Because right now there would be nothing to install from. Yeah, yeah, so two things. Yeah, there would be nothing to install or very little to install that's interesting if you're in a Laravel project because all of the recipes are for Symfony stuff. And the second thing is that the recipes assume a flex directory structure. So it's not helpful for you uh, to install a package if it puts it in the wrong spot in your Laravel project. But in theory, yes. Yeah, so a good example is most of, what you, most of the recipes are for bundles. Makes sense, right? That's most of what we install in Symfony. But PHP unit, I mentioned, is a recipe earlier. And the PHP unit's recipe, it just creates a PHP unit.xml.dist file. So in theory, that could be something that could be used across multiple projects, because really it just contains something that says the autoloader is here, which the autoloader is always the same place in all projects. And then it probably has a little config that says tests live here. So if you're in a Laravel project and tests live in a different directory than Symfony, that might not work. So yeah, it's sort of possible. It's not the aim, but as time goes on, yeah, we might kind of start to see opportunities to, to allow that to happen. Yeah, question? So yeah, you're thinking of like a future name, uh, conflict. Yes. So the yeah. So the question is that for him, and and I think it's very valid. It would have made sense maybe if it was something like this. It created a new command instead of overriding the command. It's it's it makes sense. Um, there's not there's not going to be a a collision of namespaces because. Real composer packages have to be something slash something, and the aliases are always just the short thing. But it is not, it's not obvious, and on purpose, it's not obvious that there's flex going on behind, behind the scenes. So yeah, in the future, if, there was, if you had like maybe a public um, flex and maybe a private flex server or something like that, then they could both have server on them. And I think in that, in that situation, that's actually probably what you want, because probably there's the public one that's called server. And then in your private flex server, you have overridden that. So you actually would want to override it. 
So I think with, when Fabian put this together, he wanted the workflow to feel as familiar as possible. So you actually won't see the word flex very often. That's like the name of the, the package, but for the most part, it's meant to feel like you just composer require things and, and they just install and it's the normal workflow. It's just that all of a sudden your composer packages can, can scaffold and create configuration for you. All right, good, good, good. All right, so with this, this installs the web server bundle. Um, you guys should see a couple. So when you guys install this, did you, did you guys notice what changes happened to your project? What's that? Yes, 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 the, that's one of the really important ones. All of a sudden you guys have a bin directory, bin console, which actually didn't come from the web server bundle directly, but web server bundle depends on console, so that's actually coming from the console's recipe. So if you just wanted the bin directory, we also could have said uh, composer require console, and that would have download, downloaded the console and given us the bin slash console directory. Yeah, Marco? It usually does. So yeah, the question is, would, wouldn't it be, oh, versus the makefile having the switch? No, not having the switch, as in the installer modified the local makefile. So um, it does do that. It can, so the installer can modify the makefile, but I think you're talking about the fact that the makefile right now has basically an if else for whether or not the web server is installed. Ah, okay. Yeah, you know that. yeah, yeah, it does, yeah, yeah. So after you run, once you run the, um, once you install this, you can actually start, you can use the normal bin console server call and start. You can actually still say make serve, because if you look in your make file, it's actually checking to see if the console is there, and if it is, it uses this, else it doesn't use this. However, as you guys know, I'm not a, the make file is not my favorite, so I actually don't use the make file that often. I am installing bin console, and then I'm very comfortable with bin console. I'm running bin console server run, one of the other things that you can run with make, the make command is like make cache clear, make cache warm up. I run bin console, cache clear, bin console, cache warm up. So, and you'll actually see if you don't have the console installed and you run something like make cache clear, it just deletes the, the cache directory because it, it doesn't really have, it can't do anything else. It doesn't really have the tools to do the, the normal robust cache clear, cache warm up stuff. So it kind of does a simpler thing. So the make file is really uh, most significant when there is no console. All right. So if you guys start that up, you should have the same results, but you have a better web server. Um, for example, like you can run server start and it doesn't, it, it gives you your terminal back, it runs in the background. So that would be an example of one of the things that's slightly better with this. All right, let's keep rolling. All right, now you guys have to do some work. So it's, it's, uh, at some point, you'll stop running recipes and actually have to start developing your own project. Sorry. So there's still some coding you have to do. So in this case, I want, this is actually, this stuff has nothing to do with Flex exactly. It's just we're going to create a new page. So we're going to create a new route, a new controller inside of this directory structure. And if you're used to Symfony, it's going to be familiar but not quite the same. And right now, we're going to use YAML routing. How many people that use um, Symfony use annotation routes? Yeah, a few people. We're going to do annotation routes in a second. But right now, there's no annotations in this in the, installed into the system. So we're just going to use the YAML routing and make the controller. If you have any questions or if you're confused, let me know. What I put on these slides is usually um, not all the details, because I want you guys not to just be able to copy and paste, but actually have to think and see some errors. But if my directions are not clear, then, then definitely let me know. By the way, fun fact, you can cheat. The repository has a, if you go to the repository on GitHub, uh, it has a finished branch, which is the finished code. So if you need, if you're really confused or need to cheat or something, or uh, you can go to the finished branch on the GitHub page for this and check code out there. Actually, there's a branch for every step. So not just a finished branch, there's a step for what, or there's a branch for what this step looks like. Also, this is, this is just a perfect day to be inside programming. It's actually rainy today. It's like destined, no one feels bad about being outside, you can't be outside or it's not very nice. 
So what a great time to be next to the Adriatic and in a room with no windows. I've never been so lucky here. Some of you might have done this on accident. Some of you may have uh, not uh, noticed this or maybe had it trip you up. So this, um, actually, let me ask you guys. What's this summer camp controller class? What directory should that be in? Set source. Right, just that. And what is its namespace? Yeah. So unlike Symphony 3 or 2, where you had an app bundle directory and an app bundle namespace, there's no app directory because uh, it's just wasteful. So that's yay. We got rid of a directory. Um, but we do have the app namespace. How does Composer know that our classes in there should have an app namespace? It's a quote. <laughs> because cause Flex told it to, yeah, basically. But where is it? There's something in our, uh, in our project that says, yeah, PSR4 in composer.json. So if you look in your composer.json, some of you already know this, but if you've never noticed it before, if you look in your composer.json file, there's an auto load section, and in that auto load section is a spot that says, look for things in source, expect them to start with the app namespace. So that's how Composer is able to find our classes. So again, very, very similar to Symphony 3, except we dropped the word bundle, and we removed one directory, because uh, having an empty directory is, is a bummer. And that's actually one thing I hadn't even thought about mentioning is, you notice there are no bundles. Of course, we're still installing third-party bundles, but it's no longer the case that you as an end developer will put your code in bundles. You, of course, can if you want to, but there's not really a need for it yet. Even in Symphony 3, if you guys were using the app bundle approach, you guys weren't actually relying on the fact that you were in a bundle or you were, you were relying on it very little. The bundle didn't really give you anything, any superpowers that you were using. It was just a directory. In fact, the only reason we called app bundle app bundle in Symphony 3 was because jumping from multiple bundles in Symphony 2 all the way to no bundles was a bit extreme. So we said, let's stay with the bundle and make one bundle. But then the, the long-term plan was to get rid of the bundles altogether, which is cool because uh, if I asked you, if I asked people that use Symphony a lot to define a bundle, I would probably get 20 different answers. It's like, what is a bundle? It's like, oh man, a bundle. It's a, it's a state of mind, man. It's just this thing that you have. It's just a directory. So we got rid of that. You put your classes in a directory. It's just PHP coding. Nice and simple and, and no framework kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Ah, I thought, <laughs> I thought you might ask that. The, the answer is partially, I don't know. Um, but, but the reason it's there, at least the official reason that it's there, is that Flex will, or does, or will track when you installed recipes so that later, if you update a package, do a Composer update, it will actually diff the recipe across the date that you installed it versus the date that it's now and apply the changes, almost like a, an app git install, ask you like, the vendor has a new version of this, of this file. Do you want to like do a diff of those? So that's the reason it's there. However, you are passing a unique ID back to a server. So yes, like uh, probably, uh, yeah, probably st stealing your Bitcoin. <laughs> Is that working? Delicious fish, JSON. Excellent. If you guys are having any issues, now's a good time to look confused. Okay. Excellent. 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 Uh, create the controller. Check my notes here. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, and I love this, if you're using YAML routing, you notice in your routing.yml file, the underscore controller is no longer a weird value. Underscore controller used to be like app bundle colon default colon index, and right? We'd add the word controller and we add the word action. And I would spend like 30 minutes teaching this in my symphony uh, workshops, not because it's hard, but because it's a weird symphony specific thing. 
So now it's gone, right? If you look at your underscore controller, it's a class name, colon, colon, the method name. And actually, this was always possible. If you go back to your Symphony 3 or even Symphony 2 projects, you can already use this format. You, can al you, can, you always, since the beginning of Symphony, could have set your underscore controller to a class name, colon, colon, and then the method name. It was just, with, especially with the bundle, it was just long. It, you know, it's still a little bit long, but it was even longer with the word bundle. App, bundle, slash controller, slash default controller, slash index action. Um, it's just really long. You also notice that, and I don't know exactly if this is going to become the official standard, but I think it probably might. Um, in this case, I didn't have you guys suffix your method with action. We just said fish, and then it pointed to fish. I like that because it's shorter. Um, it's a little less explicit because before you could look in your controller and everything that ended in action, you're like, that's an action. Hey, guys, everyone, that's an action. But also, if you have a public function in a controller, I hope it's an action. It should not be anything else. You should not be calling public functions from elsewhere inside of your code. Uh, public functions on your controller from other places in your code. All right, excellent. So what, uh, when I originally set up this workshop, what we were going to do next was install the console. But then when I reworked it a little bit, I was like, wait, we already have a console. Because it was installed when we installed the web server bundle. So this is mostly a step where I want you guys to notice we have installed the console. We, we got it because it was a dependency of the web server bundle, but if it wasn't, we could install it ourselves. So we have the normal bin slash console, and we can run all the commands on that. Most notably for us right now is the debug colon router, because we can see our one beautiful magic route that we have in there. So um, next thing, because we're going to keep opting into more and more features. So we have, like, it's still at this point, we basically have um, just a route controller framework, and we installed the web server bundle. But if you look in your composer.json, you can see there's still not much there. So we don't have form component, we don't have serializer, we, you know, the, the vast majority of Symphony we don't have. Um, which, which is actually, I think, is kind of cool, because it's easier to show this project to somebody and say, like, this is, this is what you have. There's not, like, 50 extra things thrown in there for you. It's just a very, very simple project. It doesn't actually do that much. In fact, I actually didn't do this. Let's, let's see here. I'm actually completely curious. If you run debug colon container, you should get a list of all of your services like normal. Um, how many services are in the container right now? None. Oh, yeah, none. It should, be, it should be more than none. That would actually be really cool. I was like, none? You have to install all of them. And it's not quite that small and pure. I thought you ran it and there were none. How many? 58. So out of the box, there's only 58 services in the container. There actually probably was a few less before we installed Web Server Bundle, maybe 50, somewhere around there. Has anybody ever done this on a, on a, Symphony, a, a, a starting Symphony standard project? <laughs> not that bad. It's not 600. That's a Drupal 8. It's about 750 out of the box with Drupal 8. <laughs> Fun fact. Drupal is actually really fun to work with because now it's like all service-based and all of a sudden, if you've never used Drupal before but you understand Symfony, you're like, oh my god, I kind of understand this. I'm freaking out. Drupal sort of makes sense to me. So in a normal Symfony standard edition, it's about 225. So 225 services and now we're down to 50. And if you look at them, they're basically all core framework stuff uh, like routing, controller, and things to kind of support that. So I like, personally, I like using annotation routes. You can use whatever you want. Uh, as I mentioned, probably by the time that Symphony 4 comes out, if you install a fresh project, you probably will actually do routing in PHP, not, e not even YAML. YAML will probably become an optional dependency for your projects, meaning you can use YAML routing, but if you start, you're going to have probably a routes.php file. And then you can install YAML if you want to do YAML, or you can install... Um, uh, annotations as we're going to do here. By the way, hopefully, and this hasn't been done yet, but when we do have routing that's done via PHP, we will hopefully have like a nice interface for it. So it's not going to be like some ugly thing where you're creating, like right now you actually can do routes in PHP. You guys have probably seen that on symphony.com. We always have like 
three tabs for every configuration. So you can see there is a way to create routes in PHP, but it's, it's long and ugly because nobody does it. So hopefully uh, we'll have a kind of a, a nicer, more f uh, fluent interface for creating routes in PHP by the time we do it. So let's install annotation support. Now there's two important things here. One is that, so this is the command I want you guys to run. The Sensio Framework Extra Bundle, that's a bundle that has historically always given us the routing annotations. But it probably, again, alpha software, things in flux, probably won't be needed in Symphony 4. It will do other things, but it won't be needed for routing annotations. Because the routing annotations actually are in core uh, as of Symphony 3.4. So in Symphony, once Symphony 4 comes out, this should just be composer require A N N O T. Or composer require annotations. Again, that's an alias. So when you run that composer require blah, 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 blah line, obviously if you look at your composer.json, you're going to have sensio slash framework extra bundle in there. You're also going to have another thing in there. What, what, what's the other thing? Like A-N-N-O-T, that's obviously an alias because it's a short thing. So what is the actual package name for the annotations package? So this makes sense. This is another, uh, it's a natural idea of the kind of flex recipe situation. Sometimes in order to get a feature, you actually need to install maybe four packages. So annotations might require like doctrine annotations and also maybe another library that is not technically a dependency of doctrine annotations, but it, we kind of need it for them to work, the whole system to work together. So we've created this idea of packs, which is a really simple idea. If you go to the repository, if you go to like github.com slash symphony slash annotations dash pack, it's a repository with a composer.json file. And that's it. That composer.json file will maybe have four dependencies. So it will install those four libraries. Cool? So it's just an easier way to do it. And also because the pack is its own repository, that gives us the opportunity to have a recipe for that. So the annotations pack installs four libraries. We might have recipes for those four libraries. But sometimes it actually makes more sense to have a recipe for the entire pack. So like when you install this pack, then we actually apply these recipes afterwards because here's some configuration that makes those four libraries all work together nicely. Cool. So once you have the annotations installed, uh, you, can, you guys can follow along on the other directions. Basically, we're going to go to our routes.yaml file and uncomment out a load section that says uh, go look for my annotations inside of my controller directory. Again, everything in Symfony is meant to be explicit or that's kind of the philosophy. So with Flex, things are happening automatically for you, but, but ideally you can actually still see the code that does things. So in this case, you guys know, uh, Symfony users know that when you load routes from Symfony, it only looks at one file to load routes. In Symfony 3, it's app config routing.yml. In Symfony 4, it's just this config slash routes.yaml. So it looks there, and, and that's it. So if you uncomment out the import line there, it's going to say, OK, now when it parses the routes.yaml, it's going to say, go look at my controller directory for my route annotations. Good question. Which route class do you use? You can use either. So when you use like the at route, it's going to autocomplete. And you can actually use either. Because basically the, the, the route annotations has already been moved to core. So if you use the one from Framework Extra Bundle, it actually extends the other one anyways. So it's all the same. So uh, you guys that have been thinking about the, the kind of the private recipes, company specific recipes, the pack idea is a really cool idea. So once, once we can make private recipes, be like, oh yeah, cool, cool, we'll make a pack. And then we'll have like the eight libraries that we always use in that pack. And then we can make a recipe for that pack to like maybe do a couple other things. Although even without, now I'm thinking about it, even without private, um, uh, the ability to have private recipes, you guys could already at least create pack repositories. If you always knew that you have like these, every project you guys use these same 10 libraries, then you could just create a repository with a composer.json file that has those 10 libraries as requirements. So that when you start a new project, you can just start your new project and then compose or require the name of your pack. And it will go download those 10 libraries. 
And hopefully, some of those 10 libraries themselves have their own recipes, so they're installing what, uh, what you need in your project. Okay, so just for my own curiosity, how many people will do a YAML routing versus annotation routing? How many people like YAML, prefer YAML routing? How many people prefer annotation routing? How many people, uh, Marco, prefer not YAML or annotations? <laughs> of course there's an XML format. We let you do X any, everything in XML in Symfony. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because we want, we want to appeal to, to the hardcore like XML guys. So yes, yeah, so you can always do routes in XML. Actually, um, uh, I want you guys to look at a file. This is sort of un unrelated. <coughs> if you guys open up your src slash kernel.php. So this is the app kernel. In Symfony 3, it's called app slash app kernel. This is your app kernel. It's been renamed to kernel. It's just the kernel. And, um, and this actually, you probably won't have to modify this file very often or ever. One of the things that's happening right now is as we're installing the bundles, they're automatically enabling themselves. We actually have a bundles.php file. You might have noticed that that's actually, things are being added to that automatically. So that was like the main thing we used to do inside of app kernel is like we step two of installing a bundle, go in there and paste some new bundle line. Um, so now this is almost kind of read only. You don't really need to modify this file, but it tells a nice picture of how the system is working behind the scenes. You can see that there is a method inside of there that is responsible for loading the kind of configuration and you can see that it's uh, kind of looking inside of your config directory. It's looking inside config slash packages. And it also is looking for multiple extensions. That's actually what made me think of this. Um, so it's actually looking inside your, for example, for routing, it's looking, in inside, it's looking for config slash routes.yaml, but it's also looking for config slash routes.xml or routes.php. So if you wanted an XML file instead or a PHP file, then you just, you just say routes.xml. And you can see the code in here that's actually going to go and find and use that. And that's true of every format. You'll actually see later when we install the logger, when it installs the configuration for itself, it actually, instead of using a YAML file, it uses a PHP file. And it's because there's actually some logic inside there that, that has like an if statement to change the configuration based on that. And, and nothing special needs to happen in our application because the kernel's already looking for PHP files as well as anything else. Uh, also, while we kind of ha have this open, are talking about this, um, the, if you guys look in the config directory, um, it's, I, it's, actually, it's actually kind of beautiful. I love the simplicity here. There's only four things in your config directory. There's uh, the bundles.php, which is just a list of the bundles you have enabled, and there's a routes file and there's a services file. Because that's really all your, your application is. It's a set of routes and it's a set of services. That's it, there's nothing more to it. Routes and services. So there's your routes file and there's your services file. And then there's a packages directory, which is where everything, as we install packages, you'll see they're gonna add more and more of their own uh, YAML files, YAML right now, YAML files inside of here to pre-configure themselves. One of the things that I'm most excited about with um, Flex, that I've just been thinking about in the last few days, is that when you install a, bu mostly bundle, when you install a bundle now, you, before, one of the steps of installing a bundle was you needed to go to the readme and maybe copy some configuration and put it in your config.yml. So you don't need to do that anymore, which is not like, oh my god, amazing, but that, that's nice, right? But it also means that the re if recipes are written the way that I want them to be written, we'll see if that works, then when you install a bundle, it will actually create its, its uh, bundle configuration file, and it will maybe have the two or three defaults you need, but maybe the other 20 things that are most commonly configured with that bundle commented out with documentation above them. So instead of you needing to go and like discover what configuration you need, um, you can actually go into that file and be like, oh yeah, it's, it's right here. I just need to uncomment out the session handler line and, and set it to, I don't know, PDO or whatever, because uh, it's actually right there. So that, the ability to kind of have you know, documentation is gonna install itself. Whereas before, it didn't really make sense to do that because if you go to install a bundle and we show you 40 lines of code, say so copy these 40 lines of code into your project, even though 30 of them are commented out, you know, it just it doesn't, it doesn't feel very nice. It's like, ooh, this bundle's huge. 
Uh, but now that things are kind of in their own file and it's taken care of for you, I think it's a good opportunity to do that. All right. Good, good, good. Everybody good? All right. Yep, alias, good, good, good. All right, checking out. All right, let's keep going. Again, so we're just thinking about, we're developing our project, and we're like, okay, what do we need next? What do we need next? So now we decide that, oh, this is not a pure JSON. We actually need a templating engine. So let's install it. Compose a require twig, which obviously is an alias. I think one of the challenges with, with going to Flex is that when you give every, when you give, when, when, when I download Symfony and it gives me everything, in some ways, my life is actually simpler. Uh, yeah, I have maybe I have this something that feels like an overwhelming project with everything installed, but I can just start using things immediately. Uh, with Symfony Flex, I think the like the the, the aim is to have better usability because you feel like you're in control. Things are small; you only get what you get. Side note: every, your application actually runs faster. Um, at some point, you're going to see benchmarks from Flex, and they're going to blow everything out of the water. It's not really fair because it's basically the first framework that gives you nothing out of the box. So if you ever see the Hello World benchmarks, it's always about like the framework that wins is the framework that removed most, was able to remove most of themselves internally to make it uh, return as fast as possible. So the downside, though, is you actually need to know what you need to install. And um, that's one of the things where right now, if, if, like how would you know to say composer require twig? Well, there's that symphony.sh page. But there might be in the future a way to... Uh, maybe run a special composer require, or sorry, composer command to get maybe some recommended packages. Because what I want is I want it to be very easy for us as developers to know, hey, here's the list of the 25 packages that are, are recommended by Symfony. So I can easily look through and say, oh, I need a templating engine, composer require twig. Or, you know, I do need um, Redis. I, want, I, need, I need Redis cache support. So composer require this library. So right now it's kind of there with the symphony.sh page, but it's not really, it's not very... All, all that readable. So when you guys install this, I know some of you are still working, which is totally fine. When you guys installed this, what, what happened? What, what changes did you notice? It's easier if I actually, if I, if I forced you guys to commit before running everything. By the way, that's, we're, not, no, we're not taking the time to do it here, but that's actually in a real project, you'd be committing things. So when you install a new uh, package, one of the cool things is you just see modified files. You go, oh, it modified this file and it created this file. Cool, I can see what's actually doing behind the scenes. Here, since we're not committing it, you probably have a lot of modified files right now. But if you kind of look carefully, what, what files did this create or modify when we installed this package? What's that? Yes, the, the, the most obvious thing is there's a templates directory. Yeah, that makes sense. We didn't need that anymore. The real motivation behind um, the, the, I should say the original thing that motivated Fabian to make Flex was that with the Symphony Standard Edition, we gave you a project that at best worked okay for you. Because if you wanted to do a traditional uh, application that talks to a database and renders templates, we gave you some of the packages for that, but not all of the packages. If you wanted to create a pure API, we gave you none of the packages you needed for that. And we gave you Twig, which you didn't need. So like this kind of mixture of all this crap you didn't need, but it wasn't all, you know, it still didn't contain all the stuff that you actually needed. So that was the idea of breaking it up. So you don't have to, if you're creating an API, you don't have to suffer the fact that Twig is installed and you have a templates directory. It's not, you're not going to have a templates directory uh, making your application ugly until you actually say, I need templating. Yeah, question. Isn't that someone, uh, uh, oh, yes, I'm glad you brought that up. That's one of the things I'm most excited about in, in uh, um, I, and, I, and I want Cilius and Easy to do this. So one of the, di one of the, one of the cool things in, we have in the Symfony world is we have projects like Cilius, like, like giant e-commerce platform, which, by the way, is going stable finally in like a week. Uh, thank God. It's been... <laughs> is it going stable? It's going stable on September 13th, uh, which I'm told is also International Programmers Day, as if our lives are so hard that we need to be congratulated on being a programmer. But that's fine. Um, and so we have, we have really nice things like, e, the e, you know, silly for e-commerce and easy for like uh, CMS related things and uh, API platform uh, for doing API stuff. 
But sometimes these big platforms, they require a lot of installation and configuration. You maybe need like several packages, and you need like five different configuration files. You need to like set up these commands. Um, so the barrier to entry is like quite high. So that's one of the things I'm really hoping for is like, yeah, we're installing little packages right now. Like, let's install Twig. Yay, we got a templates directory. But there's a lot of potential for like, let's install Cilius. Let's install EZ. And all of a sudden, we get everything we need for that, which, which might be enough steps, might be like 15 steps of install if you were following it uh, the old way. But all of a sudden now, the barrier to entry is really, really low to like bring those high quality platforms into your app. So yeah, are you guys going to... Who, who, would, who, would, who would make the easy, easy you, know, you guys going to make an easy recipe? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. He's like, eh. yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, yes. Of course. Of course. Because actually, the, the, one of the things we're going to do here is we're going to install the API platform, which already has a recipe. It's going to be one command, and we're going to have API platform built into our application. So they've already done it, and it makes it really nice and easy to demo to people. So if you want to you know, get easy in front of a few more people, you know, that would be a really low barrier to entry way to do it. Hint, hint. All right, so this created a templates directory. And um, what else did this command modify or edit? Hmm? Yes, that's one of the great things. Mod modified bundles.php. It's like you, f you will forget that file even exists because um, it just happens automatically. And then like, the one other main thing that pretty much every package does is it's going to add a configuration file or maybe multiple configuration files depending on the situation. So in this case, and I, and I really love this, um, so in, in my perfect framework, and I thought it wasn't possible before, in my perfect framework, I want my configuration to be explicit. So in Symfony 3, there was nowhere that you would see in your project that said, templates live in app resources views. It was configurable, but that was a default baked into the core. And you could override it, of course, but like, there's nothing where I could say, look, templates live here, because we have a configuration file that says templates live here. In a perfect world, that's actually what I want. I want you to be able to see that, because then if, if you need to change it or add another directory, it's right there for you. But adding configuration sucks. So that, you know, at the same time, you're like, well, I don't want to have a framework where everything has to be configured. So Flex kind of gives us the best of both worlds. So in this case, what is it? Um, config slash packages. Is it just uh, twig.yaml? Yes? Check out the config packages twig.yaml. And it answers the question, why do templates live in the templates directory? Because we have a line in our project that says that. And had we had a clean git project before we ran this command, you would see like the three files it created or modified. You'd say, oh, it created a file called twig.yaml. Oh, it has three lines, and one of them says things live in the templates directory. Ah, oh, that's it. That's simple. Cool. Got it. One other thing that this recipe did that we haven't seen yet is it also added routing. I think it's... Um, uh, is that correct? Um, so Symfony, for uh, most of you are Symfony users, has, still has the idea of environments, like the dev environment and the prod environment. And if you look at our kernel file, you'll see it has logic in there to say, okay, what's the environment? Is it dev or is it prod? And then it looks in subdirectories for routing, and it looks in subdirectories also for packages configuration. So in a little bit, you're going to see, I don't know if we have it yet, but you will see like config slash packages slash dev slash something dot yaml. And if you're in the dev environment, that automatically gets loaded. So same idea of environments, organized a little bit different, but, but same idea. So this is cool. So if a package actually has routes, it's going to automatically add the routes for you. And the recipe is smart enough to know that in this case, these are dev routes. These are like helper routes to help you build your, your 500 error template. So it puts them inside of your dev configuration. Um, same thing with bundles. Um, if you guys look in, open up the bundles.php, config slash bundles.php. It's the same thing, just done a little different. You can see when the bundles are enabled, you can see how it controls what environments they're enabled in. You can pass it in an, ar an array of environments, or you can just say all, and it's going to be, all, you know, put them in everything. And again, the, the recipe knows that, for example, if you install like Doctrine Fixtures bundle, it knows that you probably don't want to accidentally run the database reload command on production. 
So you know, it only installs that in the dev environment. Awesome. Cool, cool. Make sure. Cool. Everybody feeling good? Awesome, awesome. Perfect. All right, so at this point, let's keep score. We have like a routing controller framework, basically almost like a micro framework for routes and controllers, and we've added um, some templating to it. That's basically it. We, you know, we installed the console and the web server bundle, but it's basically a route control framework and we installed templating and it auto-configured stuff for us. Um, if you've used Silex before, it's, it's a lot like using Silex. It just automated the one step in the middle where you had to set everything up yourself with configuration. All right, so now I want to log something because there's no logger right now. If you run bin console debug colon container, you don't see a logger. So no problem, let's install a logger. In some ways, it's like it starts to feel like a little redundant. You're like, you just ask for what you need to have installed. Like, I need a logger, so let's install a logger. Yep. Ah. Good, I'm glad. I, I, I did not mention slash forgot to mention that. Um, so if you guys look in the public directory, this is unrelated to logging, so sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you guys for a second. We finally got rid of, I think Fabian begrudgingly because he loved it, we finally got rid of the two front controllers. There's now a public gasp, a public slash index.php. What a revolutionary idea. That's it. Um, and like most uh, frameworks, CMSs, there's something inside of there that detects the environment instead of it being app.php and app underscore dev.php. So that is something that is part of the, it's not like, it's not flex exactly, it's just part of the new directory structure changes. And of course, with all of this stuff, you guys could make your projects use flex and make all these changes today. Like this is a particularly easy one. If you wanted to not have two front controllers, then you delete one of them and rename the other one to index.php. And basically, boom, you have the new index.php configuration. In fact, the upgrade path from, this is very typical of Symfony, the upgrade path from Symfony 3 to Symfony 4 is going to be optional, and it's basically going to include you renaming a bunch of directories. It's going to be like, okay, well, now you need to create it. If you want to use the new flex structure, you need to take all of your new bundle lines out of your app kernel and put them in a bundles.php file. You know, and, and now you need to kind of copy the new kernel class into your directory. Or, or not, because... Symphony under the hood is not really changing. Uh, all of this is possible in a Symphony 3.3 project. In fact, this is Symphony 3.3 if you look behind the scenes. We're actually using Symphony 3.3 right now. There's nothing that we did in core to enable this. It's just a new tool and some new standards. So yes, we have index.php. So how, how does it know what environment we're in? If you guys look in the uh, public slash index.php, it's going to take me a long time to stop saying web slash. I almost did it there public slash index.php. How does it detect the environment? Yeah, dot env. See the dot env thing? So this is something that, again, is like, there's a lot of things with flex that are, we're just, are just being standardized. This dot env idea is, is very standard. Laravel uses it. Uh, they've used it for a long time. So the idea is that we, there's kind of two levels to the, how this works. The idea is that configuration should now be stored in environment variables. So instead of the parameters.yml file, where you have like your database password, you'd set those in environment variables. And this is done in part because this is a, considered like a deployment best practice. You've probably seen this. And one of the practical implications is that um, usually if you use a platform as a service like Heroku or platform.sh, uh, the only way for you to get configuration up there is they allow you to create environment variables. And then in your application, you need to read the environment variables that you've set, like your database password and things like that, and use them in your application. Um, so for example, I use platform.sh. And in platform.sh, they, they don't even tell me what my database host is. I just, they just make an environment variable for it, and I just read it at runtime. So um, this is becoming more and more common. So Symfony 4 uh, Flex is out of the box, like uh, maze that uh, using environment variables feels very um, is, is native. Hold on one second, I want to make a note to mention something later. 
Uh, of course, setting environment variables is a total pain in the butt when you're developing, so that's why at the root of your project you have a .env file. And Symfony has a new component called .env, that's what you're seeing. And so in development, and yes, you can use this on production, um, there's some overhead to parsing this file. It's not a lot, but we are parsing a text file, and it's going to get parsed on every single request. So while we recommend you actually set real environment variables and don't have this file in production, you can actually have this file in production just fine. This is basically your new parameters.yml file. Very simple .env file. And you also have a .env.dist. And these, both of these files, .env and .env.dist, are being also helped with Flex. You'll see inside there there's got some header areas. And you're actually, as we're installing recipes, it's adding things to our .env. Later we're going to install Doctrine. And it's going to add a section down here for our database configuration. Right? So again, very, very similar to parameters.yml, except it's actually going to, we have something helping us fill it out. And we are, without doing any effort, basically we can, um, uh, we can use environment variables when we push to production. Whereas right now in Symfony 3, you have to kind of set some things up yourself to do that. Cool. And actually, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Cool. All right, so sorry, that was a really good question, but uh, back to logging. So if, if I derailed you there, make sure you're installing the logger. So again, for the most part, this is fairly simple. Composer require logger. Of course, at this point, you can guess the files it modifies. It probably modifies our bundles, probably modifies our bundles.php. It probably adds a configuration file, and in fact, it does. And actually, in this case, it, it adds two configuration files. And this is us seeing the environment thing I was talking about in action, right? Because it's a config slash packages slash dev slash monologue.php. I think those are the two files. And why did it suddenly turn into a PHP file? Because there's an if statement in there, which is really handy. There's an if statement that checks to see if some class exists and then toggle something on your logger um, if it exists. So even if you use YAML, that's one of the nice things to remember is you can always back up to a PHP file if you need to. Just create a .php file and you can start banging out your, your actual logic if you need to. And actually this is a case where I think it can be done a lot better, but you're, you're seeing a situation here where you're seeing like a couple of extra handlers uh, documented here, commented out. I think we could have more documented here so it would be easier to just uncomment out and activate um, the most uh, common handlers. All right, and then to actually log things, this is a little different unless you've been following Symphony 3.3 closely. Before Symphony 3.3, Symphony 3.2, Symphony 2, how would you guys log something from the controller? Yep, get the service, then log it. So this arrow container arrow git logger, or shortcut this arrow git logger, uh, arrow info, whatever, call a method on it. And, that's, and that still works. But in Symfony 3.3, we have introduced um, basically auto wiring everywhere. It's something that you can opt out of if you want to. But um, basically in, well, in either your action methods, like our speaker's action here, or in the constructor of services, which I think is something we're actually going to play with a little bit later, um, you can actually specify what service you want just by type hinting it. So here the fact that we have the logger interface is actually going to hint to Symfony that it wants to pass us the logger service. So this is, if you've been around Symfony for a while, this feels a little bit weird. If you've actually been around Laravel, this will actually feel quite familiar. This is how most of Laravel works, is you just walk around your code being like, I need a logger, I need a this, I need a that, I need a that, and it just, I don't know, something just passes it to you. Um, so that's the philosophy behind this, is you just, t you just kind of write your PHP code and you let the configuration behind the scenes hook it up for you. Now how was it, how do we know it was logger interface, like, Obviously, if you've used Symfony for a while, you kind of recognize that's the PSR logger interface, so the type hint makes sense. Uh, but how would a, somebody else know to use that specific interface? Or, 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 and also, how did, how did Symfony know 
to pass us the logger for that. I mean, you can sort of imagine how it works. It you know, probably looks in the container and sees that there's a service in the container that has that interface and probably connects it. It's actually done more, it's, it's done in a very explicit, as little magic as possible way. I want you guys to run a command. And by the way, this feature here, everything we're about to talk about, is Symphony 3.3. So this is something you can use in your project today. It has nothing to do with Flex, um, but it's something that I want to talk about because it's a, it's a big difference in how we've done things in the past. And like everything in Symfony, when we change things in Symfony, we're mostly changing our recommendations, not the core code behind that does things. So if you still want to go out and say this arrow container, arrow git logger, arrow info, if you want to wire everything manually uh, the way you've been doing it always, like that's always going to continue to work. This is just a new layer on top of that if you want to use it. So we saw earlier debug colon container. If you use Symfony, that's a service or that's a command you're familiar with. It prints out all the services in the container. In Symfony 3.3, we added a new flag dash dash types. And this, if you think in the kind of new auto wiring way of doing things, this is supposed to be kind of the, the, the go to, the, the important command. This is going to list you all of the valid type hints that you can use throughout the system to have something passed to you. So a second ago, obviously, we didn't have a logger, which meant logger interface was not in this uh, um, uh, list. And if there's ever any doubt, Symfony throws an exception. So there's not like, oh, I don't know, there's like three loggers, so let's pick uh, the second one. Let's pick the second logger, you know? Um, no, there's a very, very explicit way to figure this out, and if there's any question at all, you're going to get a very clear exception that says, hey, I need you to give me more information, or I need you to wire something manually. The way this works behind the scenes is, and actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a story behind this. So, and this is going to help clarify what you see as far as the evolution of the documentation. Auto wiring came out in Symphony 2.8, I believe. So it's actually been around for a while. And auto wiring, again, is this idea that you are able to type hint arguments to things and, and it figures out what to pass you. In Symphony 2.8, the way auto wiring worked was it actually looked at the type hint and then looked through every service in the container and figured out which services implemented that interface or which services uh, were an instance of that class. This works with interfaces and also classes. So usually you'll see interfaces, but it works fine with, with using class type hints as well. So you used to just find everything and, and say, OK, well, is there anything that implements logger interface? And then if there was exactly one, you would be past that. And if there was zero, and this was a class, not an interface. If there were zero and this type hint was a class, we would create it for you. And if there were two, we would throw an exception. So if there's zero, we go, OK, well, let's try to create that class ourselves. If there was one, great. And if there was two, then we don't know. So we're going to throw a very clear exception that says you need to explicitly tell us what you want passed for this. In Symphony 3.3, that changed. But of course, in Symphony, we don't just break things. So everything I just told you, is still there in Symphony 3.3, but we favor a new way of doing it, and all that old way is going to be removed in Symphony 4. So that when you start using this in Symphony 3.3, you might like, do something that uh, seems like it shouldn't work, but it's working because of the old kind of helpful way, but the new way is going to be this. The way it's going to work, the way it works in Symphony 3.3, and the only way that it will work in Symphony 4 is it looks, when you type in with logger interface, which is PSR slash log slash logger interface, it looks for a service in your container whose ID exactly matches that string. So there's no uh, magic or question about it. Now, historically, we've always given our services like underscore lowercase names, like logger, like logger or logger dot something underscore something else. Uh, and that's still true for the most part. If you look at most core services, they still have that underscore kind of uh, way of doing things. Um, so to make this work, a uh, very common thing to do is to leverage aliases. How many people have used aliases inside of Symfony's container? Yeah, okay, more than I expected. It's not a very common feature. It's a very simple idea. It's almost like a sim, sim link, symbolic link. You can basically say, um, when somebody asks for the service foobar, give them the service, service logger. So in the core, when you install Monolog Bundle, Monolog Bundle actually gives you like eight different logger services. 
And actually, they all implement logger interface. But they add one alias at the bottom that is psr slash log slash logger interface, and it points to the logger service. So that's why this works, because there actually is a service in the container. It's technically an alias, but there is a service in the container whose ID matches that uh, interface exactly. And so it grabs that and uses that service. So if you wanted to use a different service, if you're like, hold on, we, we type in logger interface everywhere, but we want that to be a different service, you would just override that alias. You would say, no, 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 I go to my services.yaml file and I say, I'm going to create a new alias. PSR slash log slash logger interface goes to my logger. And all of a sudden, every uh, uh, pl place in the system is going to use um, your logger instead. So when you run that um, dash dash types flag, behind the scenes, all that does is it goes through every ID in the service container, and it looks to see which ones are classes or interfaces. So it's like, oh, it looks at the string logger. It's like, that's not a class or an interface, but it sees PSR log logger interface. It says that is. So it just filters the list to things that are actually classes or interfaces. So in Symphony 4, it's going to be really nice because you're going to get a very clear error. If there's not an exact matching thing, it's going to say, we don't know what to pass you. You either need to um, basically configure this manually, or you need to add an alias into your system that says, this interface gets this service. So you guys are perfectly controlling and opting into what's being passed to you. Cool? Now, m most of auto wiring exists um, for creating services which is something that I think we're going to have time to do later. So most of the time when we're talking about auto wiring, we're talking about you create a, a, a service class, it has a construct function, and you have like logger interface as your first argument and something else as your second argument. This is something special. The action spot, uh, when, when, when we have actions, controller actions like this, um, this is like the one place in our code where we have a function that we don't call. It's not like we have somewhere in our code where we say, oh, call the speakers function, right? It's the routing layer that calls the speakers function, okay? So because we want to help people use the auto wiring way of doing things and discourage fetching things out of the container directly, this error container error get logger, we had two options in a controller. One was we could have you use classic dependency injection which would mean that if you wanted to use the new auto wiring way of doing things, in your controller, you would create a construct function with, and type in it with logger interface, set it on a logger property, and then log further below. And actually, that works. In Symfony 3.3, if you use the uh, new Symfony 3.3 project today, all of your controllers are services. You might not even know that, and you might not care, because you can still do all the old stuff you did before. But if you want to, you can actually add a construct function and start type pending your, uh, your, your classes as services. I'm going to show you why in a second. I'm going to show you like, what code, what in our code actually activates that. Um, so, the, so if you wanted to use the new auto wiring stuff, if you wanted to kind of basically code properly, best practice in controllers, it would require you to go through that dependency injection flow, the construct function, type in the argument, set it on a property, and then use it below. That's a lot of work, especially for a controller. A controller is a spot where it's kind of the glue of your framework, and you want to be able to very easily grab things from your framework uh, and just use them. So that's why this kind of extra thing was added where we said, uh, OK, let's take this auto wiring functionality and extend it in one special place. Let's have it work also at, on our controller action methods. So that's why you can type hint here, and Symfony is smart enough to look at your action methods and, uh, and make sure it actually auto wires those as well. Yeah, so the one spot that we already saw this before was actually the request object. So you guys always know you could, you could type in the request object here. Um, so actually, in Symfony 3.2, I think, there was a new system put into Symfony called the um, Argument Resolver. So actually, just fun fact, you can actually uh, hook into the Argument Resolver system, and you can write your own custom code to resolve your controller arguments. So if you guys have some custom system where you want to be able to like, type in something and have something magical happen, you can add a custom argument resolver to Symfony to do that. So one of the argument resolvers in core of Symfony is the one that looks for the request type hint. Another argument resolver that's in the core of Symfony is the one that does the auto wiring. Because it's slightly different because the request is not technically in the service container. So it's a, it's a special case. Cool? All right, we're probably going to talk about that stuff a little bit more in a second. I'm, we're, we're about to take a break, but I want to make sure that I didn't 
miss anything super important? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, no, let's wait on that. So we're going to take, it's time 11 to 11.15. We're going to take a 15 minute break, come back at 11.15. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about this and then we're going to keep going. So this is your opportunity to go outside and get coffee and run around and, 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 and get your energy up. And also think of very uh, complex and maybe unfair questions to ask me. So you can see if you can stump me. Hiring magic being enabled. So out of the box, uh, if you removed all of this, then you have a normal Symphony system where if you want to create a service, you create a class and you go register your service in here and you wire every individual argument inside of here. Okay, so it's nice because you can just remove this if you don't want it. So a couple of things I want to highlight that, again, are new in Symphony 3.3. The first one on top is the defaults key. That allows you to specify defaults for the rest of the services in this file. So we made it file-based because right, you don't want to have defaults that modify core services. So everything in this file you know, gets these things called like auto-wire and auto-configure. The auto-wire key is the one that says, look on my class and look at the type hints and then figure out what to pass me automatically. So it's a nice way so that you don't have to like, in, in order to get auto-wiring, um, in Symfony 2.8, to get auto-wiring, this great auto-wiring feature, you still had to go to a configuration file and say auto-wire true for that service. So it sort of defeated the purpose because you still had to go to a configuration file to say, please auto-wire me. Um, so you don't have to do that anymore because it's auto-wiring all the services in this file. The second piece that's important are the <clears throat> kind of two spots below this, the app slash spot and the app slash controller spots. Let's look at the app slash spot first. This is, an, this is an auto registration of services, which if you've used Symfony before, seems a little crazy at first. So we're actually saying look in the SRC directory and register everything as a service. And it's not really that everything gets registered as a service. Um, how many people are familiar with the difference between a public service and a private service? Good, again, more people than I expected. That's excellent. So what's the, what's the, what's the difference between public and a private service? Yes, and, and using it is different. So the, so the services that are, if you have a private service and it's not used anywhere, it's actually removed from the container. And, and there's a usability difference between the two. That's correct. If you mark a service as private, so it's public false, which is something you could do always in Symfony, then you can't get it directly from the container. You can't say container arrow git. It won't be there. You can only use it as like an argument. You can only wire it into other services. So it's available there, you know, as at my service name, but you can't get it at runtime container arrow git. And the reason that even, even exists, like why, why do we even care? Why would we make our life more difficult by making services private? is that when services are private, the container can make some optimizations. And the most important one is it can actually detect if it's unused and it will just be removed from the final container. So you see on top, we actually have defaults public false. So actually all of our services are not public. They're not meant for us to grab them directly from the container. So here we can actually say, go auto register all services in my source directory or all my classes in my source directory as services. But really it's not that because if we don't use some of them, they're automatically removed. So what this line really says is, I want you, hey Symphony, I want you to take note of all of the classes inside of my SRC directory. If I type hint one of those classes somewhere, I want you to pass that to me. But if I don't and I never use it, then just get rid of it. So it makes all of our classes in SRC on the menu of being able to be auto-wired. So if you put a class inside of SRC and you run that debug colon container dash dash types, then your class will show up there because it's being loaded here. Now when it loads them, it's going to give every class, uh, the ID of the classes is actually the full namespace. So that's another difference. We kind of recommend now starting in Symfony 3.3 that you name your classes the same as your namespace. And you get it for free with this. It's just that's what it does. And the practical reason why we do that is because Remember, that's how auto-wiring works. So if I create a class inside SRC called uh, Foo Manager, uh, then I can type hint Foo Manager somewhere, and it's going to find that ID in my container. It's going to automatically auto-wire that for me. OK, so it's really the, between the defaults, the defaults having the auto-wire true, and the uh, import line here, the kind of auto-registration line, 
This allows us in Symfony 3.3 or Symfony 4 to mostly ignore the configuration file. We can just go and create a class, and then we can start type hinting what we need. We can go to our controller, type hint the class as an argument, and everything is passed around. And then if it isn't, and I think we're going to have time to do this later, if there is a problem, Symfony says I can't figure out how to wire some argument, then you will get an exception, and then you will go to your configuration file and just wire that one little part. Maybe you have four arguments to some service. Three of them are auto-wired, so you just go in there and just wire that one argument. And like I said, I think we'll have time to actually um, get through that. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. The other thing you guys see in here, which um, I think we may also do later, but I'll mention it in case, is auto-configure. So you see on the top of defaults, auto-wire, auto-configure uh, and public. Auto-configure is an auto-tagging system. It's a very Symfony-specific thing. You guys know when you, if you want to create like a tweak extension, you have to register a service, and then you have to like add a little tag that says tweak.extension. And that's what kind of like makes it a, a tweak class. With auto-configure, you don't have to do that anymore in most cases. The idea is if you guys create a class that implements the Twig extension interface and you register that as a service, how could you not possibly want that as a Twig extension? Like you've created the class, you've made it implement the very special Twig extension, you've registered as a service, and then we make you still go and do this extra step of adding the tag. So that's not the case anymore. When possible, the auto configure is an auto tagging. And I say when possible because sometimes tags have required options. Uh, an example is in event listener. An event listener, when you tag it, you have to say like the event you want to listen to and the method to call. So obviously we can't auto tag things that have multiple things, but we auto tag um, as much as we can. And if you're not sure, uh, you, would just, you can tag it if you want to. Uh, the idea is you would read the documentation on some feature and many features like a Twig extension, there's just a step missing now. One step has been automated for you. For other things like an event listener, that step is still there because you still need to tag it in that case. So it's not something you really need to think about all that much, you're just trying to automate. All right, excellent, excellent. All right, let's keep going. Let's go to, aha. So we have uh, logging, we have templating. Uh, we don't have cool debugging tools, so we're gonna install the profiler. Obviously that's an alias for the uh, web profiler bundle. Oh man, that was so great. I just saw how, how fast that worked for somebody. It's like I had barely finished a sentence to say install it and I saw him refresh and the web debug toolbar was on the bottom of the page. That is the whole point of this. <laughs> you just run commands and it just, you know, it adds it for you. It shouldn't need to configure lots of extra things. Because this recipe, it's not complicated, but it actually created two configuration files I think uh, one inside dev.yml and one inside test.yml to activate the profiler in dev and then to test it. I think it deactivates it basically. And then it also had to import routes because the, the web debug toolbar and the profiler, they're loaded through Symfony routes. So you guys uh, remember from Symfony Standard Edition, that's something you have in your, your routing underscore dev.yml file. You have these lines inside there. So it's going to add those automatically for you in config slash routes slash uh, dev slash uh, uh, profiler.yaml. So it's only going to load those in the dev environment. So yes, it just works. And if you guys, for people that maybe use Symfony a little less, just a reminder or notice that you can click any of the icons down on the web debug toolbar to go into the profiler. Most, if, if you're uh, done Symfony for a while, you know this. But this is, would be disappointing to be like, that's a cool bar, and not realize that 90% like, of the information is a click away on one of those icons. Uh, fun fact, which you may or may not know, you have the profiler uh, even for AJAX and API endpoints. Yeah, if you do a lot of API stuff, you know this. So if you, on this page is an HTML page. We have the web debug toolbar on the bottom. Clearly, it's there. Um, but if you went to our fish endpoint, which is a JSON endpoint, you also have a profiler. It obviously doesn't show the web debug toolbar on the bottom because it's a JSON page. But if you go to the way, the, the easiest way to do it, is to just go to slash underscore profiler. So if you went to like your slash fish endpoint, refresh that, and then went to slash underscore profiler, it'll give you a list of the last 10 requests made into your application. And you'll see the top one, or maybe the second to top one, uh, because of a redirect will be for your AJAX endpoint, your JSON endpoint. Or not AJAX, your JSON endpoint, your API endpoint. And you can click the little 
hash link on the right, little hexadecimal hash link on the right, to go into the profiler for that uh, API call. So it's like the number one thing I think is ignored by people when you create an API. You're like, you know, you're not taking advantage of this tool. Is that um, one of the uh, ways that the profile is most useful, by the way, with API calls is, at first I thought this was the most useful, useless uh, tab ever. One of the tabs on the left of the profiler is exception. If there's an error on the page, it shows you the error, which if you're making an HTML web app seems like the most useless thing ever, because you probably just saw that error a second ago. But if you're using, uh, building an API endpoint or something like that, that will actually show you the big, beautiful, fully styled HTML error. Uh, instead of trying to read it down in your network tools or something. Uh, just a way, you know, I kind of keep this open because uh, it's an easy way to get to uh, see your errors. All right, let's keep rocking. So this is going to seem silly, and it sort of is. But since our internet is totally kicking ass, we're going to do this. I thought we might skip this step. Why don't you guys do install the translator? And then once you're feeling really good about your multilingual site that you're going to make, I want you to remove it. And I just want you to see in action, one of the things that's obviously what I'm highlighting here is like Flex actually uninstalls things. So it runs the recipe in reverse. And actually, this is totally not implemented yet, but the dream is actually to be able to update recipes as you update a package. So you can imagine that you're using monologue bundle version 1.3 or something like that and you do a Composer update to upgrade it to 1.4, the dream is that Flex actually would do a diff between what the recipe looked like the day that you executed it versus what the recipe looks like today, and then basically patch those changes in. So it would look a little bit like an like a apt-get um, update where like it overrides configuration files, but if you modified it and it modified it, then it would ask you, like, what do you want to do you know, to like put these two things together? So again, that's not something that's there, but like all the pieces are there. It's just a technical challenge of making Flex smart enough to be able to kind of uh, keep track of, um, uh, basically be able to do that diff. So, but it does remove things. Mm -hmm. Yep. I actually don't know the answer to that. I have not done enough stuff. The question is, well, if I actually have, so this creates a, a translations directory, one of the things it does. So if there's stuff in the translations directory, does it just remove that? Um, somebody should actually try that. I actually don't know the answer to that. And I also don't know what the answer should be. In theory, like, yeah, icing, killing things is not a good thing, but also having a recipe not really uninstall itself is kind of a bummer. And there's really, at this point, the assumption that you're having version control. If you install something out of a bunch of translations, those have been committed to Git. So I don't know what the behavior is, and I don't exactly know what it should be. I'm conflicted on that. Same goes for templates. Yeah, this happens all the time, the templates. Um, and also the configuration files, like, right? So if we had and install the logger and then modify the logger, the monolog.php files, like added some custom configuration. Well, if you remove the logger, it's going to remove those configuration files. My gut tells me that it will remove them, but I'm not, <coughs> not I, don't, I don't actually know that for sure. But you guys are going to find out for me, some of you. It is, okay. Ah, that makes sense. So the, the answer is that the translations directory remains, but, um, but the .git ignore file that was in there got removed. Yep, which makes sense. So one of the things you'll see is like when a lot of times when you install a recipe, it, it needs to create an empty directory. But you guys know you can't, there aren't empty directories in Git. So it puts a, an empty .git ignore file in that directory. Uh, that's how it looks in the recipe. So yeah, so really like from a, from a Git standpoint, what the recipe does is it doesn't create a directory, it creates a file, it creates a template or a translation slash dot git ignore file. So run in reverse, it just deleted that file. And then of course, you, you know, it takes the, probably takes, takes the directory with it if, it if it can, but yeah, leaves it. So yeah, that's interesting. 
All right, so let's do something that always breaks workshops. Let's use the database. I debated having this spot, but actually, because the internet is working better than I could have dreamed of, so we're actually like moving through things really nicely. So I'm glad I have this now. So we're going to install the ORM, which again, like there are many ORMs. The ORM that you guys know that is, is most commonly used with Symphony is Doctrine, so it gets the ORM alias. So that's actually, I think that's, that's there's an ORM, this is one of those packs, there's an ORM-pack that this is installing behind the scenes. This is also the first time that we will see the .env file, .env file being modified. You know, we originally got a .env file when we, when we originally installed, but now this is actually going to add something else to it, which is really, really nice. So your .env, .dist, and your .env file will get modified. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. So the question is, is, there, is it possible or a plan to have the uh, recipes be interactive, like if they want to ask some questions? Right now, no, and probably no. And I think the biggest reason behind that is uh, Fabian wants uh, Composer to act like Composer. And if you start asking things interactively, there's always the chance, even though it shouldn't do this, there's always a chance that you run something uh, like in deploy or something and suddenly it starts asking questions. It shouldn't do that because on deploy, you're just running Composer install and that reads from the lock file. So Flex knows you're not installing anything new. So it doesn't run the recipes. Uh, but I think he wants to keep it hands off. But that is one of the things I've thought about too. Like, you know, when you install the logger, okay, well, I'll just give you some defaults. But if you install, how, how many people have used uh, like FOS user bundle? Few people. There's like, when you install FOS user bundle, there's a couple bits of required configuration. Like what's your user class? Are you using the ORM or the ODM? So that's actually a bundle where kind of makes sense where you might think when I install the FOS user bundle, it maybe would ask me those three questions. But right now it doesn't do that. It probably won't do that because we want things to just install. Probably the, the closest we're going to get is wh I, one of the things I think that the recipes aren't doing well right now is that when you install a recipe, you can give the user a message afterwards. And we only saw it once when we ran our first Composer install. There was something at the bottom that said, I don't know, thanks for using Symfony. I hope you're having a wonderful day. And then it said, you can run make serve to run the application. But none of the other recipes, if I remember correctly, are giving you that. So I think especially if you install a bundle that really has some required configuration, or, or in this case, like your database parameters, it'd be cool to say, hey, um, now go modify your .env file and look for this line to modify. And maybe here are two commands you can run to, st to create your database. So I think we can do a better job of pointing out where you, what you might want to do after you install a recipe. Yeah? So yeah, it's server version, yep. Bup, 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 bup. Server version, yep. Which I think we don't need anymore because of that one pull request. You know what I'm talking about. Still needed. It's not as big of a deal for us anymore because we can just auto put it for people. So we're going to create one table in the database. You can see I have a menu item entity that I'm giving you so we don't have to spend time creating the menu item entity. Is that working? Database loaded? So uh, one thing I want to highlight here is, so obviously we have the .env file, which is like parameters.yml, got it, got it, got it. Um, I want you to look at where that environment variable is used, though. So we, this is apparently creating a new database underscore URL environment variable. Where is that used? It's in a YAML file. That's a safe guess, right? It's in a YAML file. Which YAML file? You can also kind of guess if you think about yeah, perfect. That's exactly config slash doctrine dot yaml or config slash something like that. You know, so yeah. There, in this case, it actually is config slash packages slash doctrine dot yaml. Yeah.
The interesting thing is that if, when you look inside of config packages doctrine.yaml, you see that it's not just percent database URL percent. Like we're used to parameters.yml, that sets a parameter in Symfony, and then we have like this magic way of rep representing that. It's actually surrounded in this env thing. So that's actually a special syntax. It's existed since I think Symfony 3.1, maybe earlier. It's a special syntax inside of Symfony's configuration file to read an environment variable. Because that's what the .env system does. It, it reads your .env variable uh, file and just sets those as environment variables. It's, it has nothing to do with Symfony's container or parameter system. It doesn't set any parameters. It just loads those into environment variables. Then to actually read environment variables wherever they came from, whether it's a .env file or we're actually setting real environment variables on production, you use this special percent env open parentheses syntax. The reason that exists and looks kind of weird is, is um, it's actually very critical if you guys use platform as a service like Heroku or platform.sh. One of the requirements if you use a platform as a service is that they tell you that you need to build your application in a way so that your host, Heroku, for example, can change an environment variable at any time and your application immediately uses it. So they're saying, hey, don't save the database name anywhere, the database host, because we might just change it because they might need to spin up more servers. So all of a sudden they spin up a different server for you and your database host changes immediately. So the problem with Symfony's container system is that it compiles down to a final file, which makes it really, really fast. But historically, what's that, what that's meant is in parameters.yml, if you set your database host name inside of there, even if you read that from an environment variable, let's say we make a um, uh, parameters.php file, right? And we, make, and we read like the, the git end function in PHP, and we actually read the environment file, and we actually like maybe even set it as a parameter, and then use that parameter later to configure doctrine. So let's say we use some PHP logic in our configuration files to read environment variables, right? Great, we've done it. Except that when Symfony builds its container, it takes the environment variable and actually looks at the string and saves that string inside of the cached container. So if you were able to look at like the, you know, if you went to like the core cached file, somewhere you'd find, you know, not exactly, but somewhere you'd find like new PDO, something like this, right? There'd be some line somewhere that, that actually uh, uh, has the line that inst uh, creates your database driver. It would actually have something that looked like this, not what you actually want, which is something that looks a little bit more like this. Does that make sense? You, don't, you want your final code that runs at, at compile time to actually get the environment variable, not get whatever it was at compile time and save it as a hard-coded string. So the percent env weird thing percent is a way to do that. That's a way where you can actually say, I want you to read this environment variable, but don't actually, don't actually go figure out what it is. Just, just save that in this final file as something that looks like this, actually as an, an environment, uh, sorry, not environment, but git, git env call. Cool? Again, like this, if you've, you've worked with platforms as a service, this is probably making perfect sense. If you haven't, you probably never hit this problem before. You probably will at some point. Um, Which part readable? Like the weird percent env percent thing? Oh, oh, the database URL. Yeah, if you want to, you can split the database URL into like database name and database password, and then you could read percent env percent. Um, yeah, yeah, you can totally do that. Uh, I think we made it. We changed it to database URL so like just to have like one environment variable. Yeah. So, but that's a good point. Yes. Hey, if you want to create multiple, some new environment variables here, then just go to your configuration file and just start referencing those environment variables there. Um, when you have, when you, the nice thing is when you use environment variables like this, it actually means that you can build your container cache somewhere that is not your production server. So normally you might need to like actually be on your production server where you have your environment variables available to you in order to read them. But now you can actually build it over here, the entire thing, because uh, it's not reading the environment variables at that moment. It's just printing out the git env in your final file and then ship it off to, uh, to your server.
So it's a subtle thing, but if you do use, if, if you need this, uh, and it doesn't, you know, before this existed in Symphony, it was basically a huge pain in the ass to get this to work correctly. All right, good, good, good. Check my notes here. Awesome. Let's keep going. All right, so we created the database table. So I was like, what's a, what's a really uh, fancy way that we could show this off? Um, and it's to install API Platform. Most of you probably, hopefully, uh, went to the API Platform workshop Wednesday, right? Yes, I'm getting no, but yeah. So, yes for some people, no for some people. So we're going to install the API Platform into our project right now, which normally, again, rough edges, normally would be Composer Require API, because we give it an alias. But there, we need to wait for the API platform to tag like a new version 2.1. There's some Composer unreleased things happening. So instead, we have to run this ugly long command right here so we get the unreleased 2.1 at dev version. Uh, but again, that's just temporary. It'll be Composer require API at some point soon in the future. And this is the closest example we have of of installing something that's a little bigger. Not that the API platform is all that big and complicated, but there's going to be a little bit more configuration that you're going to see that this installed. You can see just from the composer require, this installs a bunch of packages. So it's like this one is a little bit more involved. It actually put translations back. We have translations again. It actually installed Symphony security, which we didn't have before. So mostly, like, you know, one of the takeaways I want you guys to have is like, you know, Flex is not, it's not really that magic. It's just a small bit of automation. It's step, after you run the Composer require line, usually step two and three of the README is to go enable the bundle and then add some configuration. And that's just, that's just done automatically for you. It's not gone. It's not like in the core. You can see the configuration still. It's just added there for you. And as I mentioned earlier, that gives recipe authors the opportunity to give us developers even more configuration or more commented out configuration with documentation that explains here's some other features that you might want to uncomment and use. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And at the same time, we're seeing many other changes in Symfony, a lot of the directory structure changes, .env, .env, that system has nothing to do with Symfony Flex. That's just a change that's being made. So there are a couple other things that are going on. So when you install API Platform, this is just kind of a fun one because everything just, it's one of those that like demos really well. You're like just run this one command and all of a sudden you have like an API for your menu item. So you should be able to go to slash menu underscore items. You see some nice documentation. You can add .json in the end or JSON LD and get different format. We're not going to go uh, any further into this because there was another workshop on it. Also, I'm unqualified to teach you anything about API Platform, because I don't know it that well. Um, side note, whenever you run Composer, um, you can pass a dash VVV flag. Probably a lot of you know that for very, very verbose. And um, sometimes that's interesting. You can see what Composer is doing behind the scenes. And it actually gives you a little bit more information about what the recipes are doing behind the scenes. Um, so right now it just says, like, I did the recipe. That's it. And you're like, cool. So this will tell you a little more information about what that's actually, what that's actually doing. All right. So we actually went through things faster than I thought. So now we have extra credit time. So we're going to go to, like, empty notepad here. And I'm going to give you guys a couple other exercises. Because one thing I want to, we've talked about at a decent length, but I actually want you guys to code through, is some of the real auto wiring stuff. So I'm going to give you guys sort of a challenge here. I'm going to give you kind of mostly the goal, not the individual code to fill in. Then I'll help and add more code as necessary. But here's the goal. Right now, our slash fish endpoint is like four hard coded fish names, right? But now we have a menu item entity which has some fish in it. So what I'd like to do is on a very high level and not, not hard code that anymore. Cool. But 
We're going to go more interesting than that. I want to isolate the logic for querying the database and getting the fish names into a service. So right, like good developers, we're going to be like, okay, let's use services instead of putting this code in our logic. It's not very complex logic, but we're going to organize things into a service. So we're going to get a fish cooker service. It's going to have a get fish names method, and then it will query the database. The database query is going to be inside of that method. And you don't have to get fancy with the query. If you want to, you can actually make a query that only selects the names. But honestly, the easiest thing is just to find all of them and loop over and get the names off of them. That's the database query is not really the important part. And this, so this is a fairly straightforward exercise, but it's actually going to do touch on several different parts of the auto wiring, auto registration system. Because you should be able to do this entire thing without touching, your, uh, without touching any YAML files. You should have to create this one class and, and uh, code your controller. So you'll only touch two PHP classes, the new service class you're creating and the controller where you're using it. No configuration files. So those are my vague instructions. It's a mission. So since we need the, we need to make a database inside of our fish cooker class, that means we're going to need to use dependency injection inside the fish cooker class. So it's going to need a construct function because we're going to need to pass in the entity manager into the fish cooker. So what does uh, what is your construct? So here's our fish cooker class. What does your construct argument look like? Ah, good. There are a couple. There are a couple of correct answers. Some are more correct than others, but but both will work. So what I saw many people do, which is the correct, but maybe slightly less correct than other ways, way of doing it is by type hinting with any entity manager. The ever so slightly more correct way is to type into with entity manager interface. Now, why does that matter? In, like, from an object oriented perspective, I think you guys understand it's better to type into interfaces. But you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, okay, we should, but but it's not the end of the world if I type into a class instead of an interface. Cool. With auto wiring, it's a little bit more important because remember when if you run the bin console debug container dash dash types. It's going to give you that list of valid type hints. An entity manager is not a valid type hint. So when doctrine bundle uh, uh, is installed, the doctrine bundle adds an alias for entity manager interface, but it doesn't add an alias for entity manager. Why not? It's just trying to gently push you to using the interface instead of the concrete class. Now, so why does, so in theory then, type hinting with entity manager shouldn't work because uh, there's no ID, there's no service in the container whose ID is entity manager. But because of the old way of doing things, the Symphony 3.2 way, it sees entity manager, doesn't see any service in the container whose ID exactly matches that. So it looks through the entire container and finds one service whose class is entity manager and uses that. However, if you looked, if, if you did it this way and got the page, sorry, if you did it with entity manager and got your whole page working, 
if you went to the profiler for that API request and you went to the logs, you would see a deprecation notice. Because it's going to tell you, hey, hey, no, 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 you can't do this entity manager thing anymore. You need to use entity manager interface. Or if you guys want to use entity manager, you're like, dude, that's lame. I don't care. That's fine. Just create your own alias. You can go to services.yaml and you could say, I know that there's no core entity manager class, but I want to alias the doctrine slash ORM slash entity manager to doctrine slash ORM slash entity manager interface. And just with this one line of code, you would have, uh, uh, you'd be able to type in with entity manager instead of the interface if you wanted to. That literally looks like, you guys don't have to put this, I just want to show you. That's what an alias looks like in YAML. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Left goes to right. Yep, I'm getting lots of nods because you're like, yeah, that looks exactly how I would expect it to look. So then you can type in with, uh, with Entity Manager Interface. Um, and also this is how clearly you would override any uh, core auto wiring. If you wanted Entity Manager Interface to go to a different object, then you would override the, uh, you'd create a new Doctrine ORM Entity Manager Interface alias, which would override the core one. So it's very straightforward. You're in control of what gets auto wired. And then let's just fill in the logic down here. I'll do this in the least efficient way. I call it get item. Is that the name of the property? Thank you. You guys are linting my PHP. Tell me if that's wrong. I obviously, this is the least efficient way to do that. You would, in a real application, probably maybe query for the names, but you know, fi let's find them all and then we'll loop over them and get their names out. And simple enough. <laughs> Now, as soon as you guys created this class, it was in the container. So just as soon as you said class uh, fish cooker with the namespace, as soon as you did that, if you ran debug container colon dash dash types, your class is inside of there, thanks to the auto registration stuff. So that's kind of magic thing number one. And then, of course, because of the, the defaults auto wire part, it meant that any service that's created in that file, like this one, automatically gets auto wiring which is why the Entity Manager interface uh, gets dialed in. If you're new to Symfony, the idea is that you don't even realize this is happening. I'm giving you guys more story of how it's enabled because you guys have been using Symfony for a while for the most part. So for a new Symfony developer, we would basically kind of say, run debug container dash dash types, and here's a list of, of classes, and if you ever need these classes, then just type in them, and, and there you go, you get them. Oh my gosh, is it? Oh my gosh, yeah, not names equals. I think sometimes I... S Thank you, it is as. Sometimes I, I slip into JavaScript and then I end up somewhere in between. So in my mind I was doing like um, a map. Like, you know, names equals like an array map. Whew. And I looked at that and I was like, yeah, that looks right. Yeah. That's it. So maybe not items, but uh, yeah, now I, now I see the problem. Names. That's better. So let, let's not overwrite a variable if we don't have to. And the last step here, I think I saw many people get this without any problems at all, is pretty obvious. Right, something like that. It's 
even shorter than getting it out of the container. It's even shorter than this arrow container arrow get or this arrow get. Just type hint the thing that you need. All right, what about logging something? We're going to do this quickly together because it's not that hard. But now I decide I want to log a message inside of my fish cooker. So let's do that. It's basically the same thing, right? So we'd say, logger interface logger. Let's just use it down here. Make sense? Pretty sure it does because it's the first part made look like you, well, most of you guys basically got that instantly, which is great. So this is the exact same thing over again. So now I'm going to tell you about a feature that exists in Symphony 3.3 but nobody knows about and it's kind of a cool idea, is that auto wiring, auto wiring obviously works for constructors, right? It makes perfect sense. There's also setter auto wiring. And it has a very powerful idea that, we, that you could turn this into. And we haven't done it in core yet. We might, but you guys could use it in your application. So let's say needed in logger is fairly common, right? So this is pretty simple. Actually, let me, let me back up and let's approach this a different way. Let's say for some reason, and I'll give you a good reason why you would do this in a second. For some reason, you don't want the logger to be injected through the constructor. You want to have a set logger function. Cool? So let's take it out of here. You just have to trust me on this one. Cool. As long as somebody calls that method, it's going to work. If nobody calls that method, it's not going to work. And right now, nobody's going to call that method. So we wanted to add setter auto wiring too, but we needed a way for you to opt into it because us just calling all of your setter methods is not a good idea because maybe you have like a it's using some class that has an optional set logger method that type hints an optional logger class from an optional package, and then we try to set it, and that class doesn't exist, and every, every, everything explodes, when really we should have just done nothing, because you didn't want that setter to be called. So the way that you opt in to setter injection is a little annotation. Not really, it's not even an annotation. There's not a, you, don't, you don't need a use statement for this. It's just a little special PHP comment at required. As soon as you do that, again, this is Symphony's way of being like doing auto wiring, but doing it explicitly. We talked a long time about like, should we automatically auto wire everything that starts with the word set? You know, and there was like edge cases. So we're like, screw it, let's do nothing. And then you opt into it. And the cool thing about this is, if we can't auto wire that method, because maybe we forgot to type hint or something's wrong, we're going to throw an exception versus being like, ah, we couldn't call it, so let's do nothing. You know, let's, let's not throw an error. Since you said at required, we will call this. And if we can't, we're going to throw an exception. Cool? Now, setter injection is not quite as sexy as constructor injection. And before auto wiring, it was even less useful because you had to remember this annoying calls syntax. You guys use the calls syntax before in services.yaml? So there's always been a way in services.yml to say, when you create this service, call this method and pass this argument. So there'd be a calls key under your service, and then it's got kind of a weird, ugly YAML syntax. So this lowers the barrier to entry to have like setter injection. Now, the really reason I think this is cool is it opens the possibility for um, like trait injection. So you can imagine you guys in your code add a logger trait. The logger trait would have a set logger method with at required above it. And then you would have like a private logger property. So then if you use the logger trait in an auto wired class, that's all you have to do. Then you can just start using the logger property 
because the trait is going to be uh, automatically that it's it's going to include this code for you, so it's going to cause that setter injection. Yep. Why? It's, I mean, with traits, it's just you're copying and pasting code anyway. So using this code, this code to me is identical to using this code in a trait. Yeah, this code is already a bad practice. Yeah, yeah. This code is already a bad practice because you should be, you should be coding safely with the logger. You should be saying, like, if this error logger or if not this logger does not equal null or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So that depends on your area, your level of comfort. Like, if you're in the Symfony framework, this is safe code. But this is not best practice code. If you unit test this, now you have to call the said logger because you've coded to require the logger. So yeah, in a really best practice way, this is great. But since from an OO perspective, we are not requiring the set logger to be called, uh, we should probably code defensively. And if you unit test your code, you're naturally going to do that because you're immediately going to be annoyed that you have to uh, mock a logger interface when you're, maybe your class doesn't actually need it. Yep. You uh, to basically um, actually ask that again. I think I understood, but can you add an extra line in the instructor to say this logger is null logger? Say ah, so like um, hinting. So ask, can you put, put something in the constructor that says this logger is is null logger? So always. Oh yeah, that's a good. That's a really great idea. So yeah, yeah. So you're just talking about the, not even a symphony feature, just a object-oriented tactic. Yeah. So if you wanted to, you could in your constructor initialize this error logger to new null logger, or you could have a git logger method on your class that if you call it and there is no logger, returns you a null logger. So that'd be a really good way to go around that if you wanted to. So it's very, you know, it's this is where pragmatism meets best practices, and you have to find your center spots. To me, it's very powerful to be able to have a set of traits that you can just use that trait in your class and you've, you've injected the dependencies you need. However, it will make, and everything is going to work great, and everyone's going to have a party. If you unit test that, it's going to be a little bit, it's not going to look quite as clean because you need to remember to, when you instantiate your class, you need to remember to call your two setters or else your unit test isn't going to work correctly. So that's like the downside of, of doing something like that. Cool. Yep. Ah, oh, I'm really glad you asked that. This is a really great question for people that use Symphony quite a bit. So right now we injected the entity manager service. So the question is, should we have instead created a repository service and injected that? So you guys know if you use Doctrine, there's entities and there's repositories. And the repositories by default are not services. There's things that you have to get out by going to the entity manager and saying git repository like this. Um, so what some people do is they say, OK, let's, let's register our repository as a service. And there's no automatic way to do that. You have to go to your services.yaml file, and you have to, there's some code you can put. It's a factory code. But you can basically say, I have a service called, in this case it would be, I have a service called maybe menu item repository. And you can register that in your container. And then that would allow us to type in menu item repository instead of passing the entire entity manager interface into our code. This is a better practice because it's, we're passing in the smaller dependency. You know, we're not passing the entire entity manager. We're passing just the thing we need. And of course, it makes mocking easier. The problem is, it's kind of two problems. One is that we have all this nice auto wiring. And suddenly, I tell you that you need to go and manually wire your entity, your, sorry, your repository services if you want that. OK, that's not the end of the world, but that's a, a barrier to entry, because everything else is auto-wired, but I have to go do this one thing by hand. This, the second problem is it's a little more subtle, is that sometimes the entity manager can go, and can go into a closed state. Basically happens when there's an exception being thrown. And what you're supposed to do is there's actually a class called a registry. You're supposed to actually take, get the registry and always ask for the entity manager from that. Because if I understand it correctly or remember correctly, if the entity manager becomes closed, I think when you ask for the entity manager, it will give you a new one. 
basically, if you inject the, if you inject the repository, and I think if you, even if you inject the entity manager, it's possible that that entity manager will get into a closed state, and you won't be able to like, do queries on it anymore. Whereas if I pass this registry thing, then I can ask the entity manager, and it will give me whatever the kind of correct one is at that moment. It's kind of an edge case thing, but we, it came up because we were trying to, in Doctrine Bundle, we said, OK, great, we have auto wiring everywhere. So let's give people an option to automatically have all of their repositories registered as services. Done. But then we got into this problem where we're basically giving people bad code. It's edge case, but here, Doctrine Bundle is going to automatically register repositories as services. And by the way, that's not a good idea anyways. So we're like, we can't, you know, we can't do bad things in a reusable bundle. So here's where I think we are with the repository system right now. And actually, Marco can tell me if, if he disagrees with me. And for me, the repository system exists because Doctrine was created when there was a time when containers weren't actively being used. So Doctrine basically made their own mini container where you can say, we, you can ask the entity manager for a repository class and we'll create it for you. If Doctrine hadn't done that before containers, nobody would have created repository classes because you would have been responsible for creating yourself and figuring out how to pass it around everywhere. So they made their own mini container system inside of there. Is that fairly accurate? Yep. So basically, the, the Doctrine doesn't need to do that anymore. And I don't think Doctrine should do it anymore because it's a very different uh, time now. So what I think we should do in the Symfony community is move away from the repository classes towards just creating our own services. And yes, we should still probably have some generators to help us build this. But here's what a repository class should look like. Don't use uh, the uh, repository system at all in Doctrine. Just create a class called menu item repository, and then dependency inject the um, registry interface. That's the, when you guys say this arrow, container arrow, get doctrine, and you ask for the doctrine service, that's actually a, a registry class. You, so you basically dependency inject the registry interface, and then, and then everything else would look the same. You, you would create find methods, and in those find methods, you would go and ask for the entity manager from the, um, uh, the registry, and you'd create a query on it. So it's like, don't let Doctrine create your repositories for you anymore. Just create them yourself. And then we don't have to register them anymore. Because if I, go to a, if I create a new class called menu item repository, and it has nothing to do with Doctrine, and I add a constructor, which is type hinted with registry interface, everything gets auto-registered and auto-wired, and I can immediately use that class. So there's no, you don't see this idea very many places. It's kind of a new idea, and I think it's something that we'll, we'll move to, because it, it makes perfect sense. Because the big complication is that Doctrine creates the repositories for us. Ugh, so they just don't play well uh, with the auto-wiring. They don't get auto-wired into the system. So yeah, really good question. Awesome. So what happens if I do that? So auto-wiring is, is the end-all, be-all, almighty, wonderful thing, right? Until we have an argument that doesn't have a type hint, Womp womp. So try that out. What's the, let's check out what the error says. Hopefully it doesn't work. If it works, that's creepy. It should not know what to pass for that argument. So let's see, what's the error on that? You got it? Auto wiring failed exception. Cannot auto wire service uh, fish cooker. Argument dollar sign max fish of method construct must have a type int or be given a value explicitly. Isn't that, isn't that a nice error? Not that we ever read errors, but if we were to read an error, which of course we don't do, uh, that's, that's a pretty nice one. So we either need to give it a type int or we need to wire it explicitly. So the workflow with auto wiring is you don't worry about configuration at all until you get a big error like this that says, hey, worry about configuration. You need to go wire this manually. So that means we actually do now need to go to our services.yaml file. By the way, for people that don't like YAML, I'm looking at the two most opinionated guys in the room right now. There is, you already know this, there's a pull request in Symfony's core to replace the services.yaml file with a fluent uh, PHP interface. So it would actually be PHP code, which is especially useful because now that everything is class names, inside of here, if we want to configure that service, we actually need to say app 
slash, I put mine in a service namespace, so change yours if yours is different. We actually need to say the service's ID, which is now the class name. If this were a PHP file, we could use the class constant. You know, we could just say fish cooker colon colon class, and that would save us from typing the whole class name. So real quick, because of auto registration, the lines above this, we have a service whose ID is app slash service slash fish cooker. We are now overriding that service entirely. That's why the ID of this needs to match. So we're actually saying, great, I know you, it's, it's almost like you have this key in YAML twice. You have it once up here because of the auto registration, and now we're overriding it below. Say, auto registration doesn't work, so I'm just going to register this service myself. Well, there's two cool things. One is that now that we kind of recommend you have your class names as your IDs, if your class name is your ID, you don't need the class key anymore. So I don't have to now say class app slash service slash fish cooker, because that would be stupid. So you, know, you, don't have to, you can leave it off if you want to. The only thing we need to do is we just need to tell Symfony what the one argument is to our service. That's the only thing it can't figure out. So all we need to do is just skip straight to arguments. And what I call mine, max fish. Yep. You guys didn't like that? Yes, with a dollar sign, yes. So normally it's just like dash, because you're just passing it the zero index, one index, two index, three index. So in Symphony 3.3, we allow you to do a named argument. There was a discussion on whether or not we should have the dollar sign be there. We ended up doing the dollar sign to like emphasize that this is the name of the argument. So it was just a subjective decision to be like, let's use a dollar sign. This is an argument name. So that's going to fill in that argument. So this is cool because you can just pick and choose. And the error message said that. It said, could not auto wire max fish arguments. It's telling you exactly what one argument you need to specify. And then it's going to auto wire everything else. Now, this, in theory, is delicate because normally if you have a construct, an argument to your constructor, the name of the argument is not important. From an object-oriented perspective, we can change the name of an argument, and that shouldn't break our application at all. That's an internal change. And that's true. So this is a little bit weird in that way. But because Symfony builds its entire container at, at, uh, at uh, compile time uh, and validates everything, um, Symfony is going through all of your services, and it's looking at those named arguments. And if it sees a max fish here and does not see a max fish argument there, you'll get a huge exception. It doesn't even matter if you're on a page that doesn't use that service, because it builds all of the services at once. So even though this is a little weird, because all of a sudden the name of that argument is important, if you change that name, every page is broken, and it's going to give you that exact error. It says, you've wired a max fish argument. I do not see a max fish argument in your construct function. So it's all about being explicit and, and exploding as spectacularly as possible when something goes wrong. Cool? One other thing you'll see also, and this might be the, may become the, uh, the more uh, hipster way of doing it, is there's also a bind keyword. It's new in Symfony 3.4. And it does, it does the same thing, but this would do it for any method. So if you had, a, if you had setter injection, um, then, uh, and you had a max fish on a setter or something like that, then, then this would do it. So this would be like anywhere I auto wire on this class, not just the constructor, uh, use that. So it's like a little more universal. <laughs> All right, good, good, good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Just checking my notes here. All right. You know, I'm going to stop right there because we have like five minutes left. So I'm not going to shove any, anything more down your guys' throat. Um, does anybody have any, you guys have been asking great questions. You guys have any other questions, wonderings, weirdnesses that you saw? Math questions? Yep. Multiple what? Oh, do we have any plans to support multi-kernel setups? The answer is no. Uh, one, because it's sort of an edge case. But two, because it's, it's, hmm, let me say this. Let me think about this. I want to say it because it's quite simple. 
But what I have not really thought through is how would that play with flex stuff? I think the way it would play with flex stuff is if you had multiple kernels is you would still use flex. Huh, I'm not actually sure. I would think that you'd still use flex to put everything into your config directory, but then you would f uh, create two different kernels yourself and then um, rewrite the loading code in there to like load only the specific stuff you need to. But it's not, yeah, it's not totally clear to me, but I know that we won't support it as like a main use case. At best, it would be, let's make sure there is a sane way of doing it and like add some documentation. Yep. People do it. It's valid, but it's just not many people do it. Yep. Anything else? All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. If you have more questions after, come up and get me. Um, but yeah, thanks, guys. We actually got through more stuff than I expected because you guys are pros and the internet held up. So I'm very, very happy about that. Thank you.